Uh, it's a real pleasure to have our speaker for today, Professor uh, Neil Jones, Professor American Emeritus from uh, the University of uh, Copenhagen. Uh, Neil is known for many things, and it's very hard to do justice to all of the things that he has uh, worked on. Um, many of us will know him for his work on partial evaluation, and in particular the work on offline partial evaluation that essentially set the world on fire and generated tremendous activity of work uh, in this area. Um, Neil is also known for seminal work on data flow analysis, control flow analysis, termination analysis, um, and also important work on the theory of computation. Um, without further ado, uh, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure to uh, hand over uh, the mic, so to speak, uh, to Neil to tell us about some really exciting work that he's been doing recently that relates both to computation and physical manifestations of uh, computation. So please welcome with me Professor uh, Neil Jones. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, this work uh, uh, really has more, in a way, more to do with the theory of computation. Though, though, though it has sort of, sort of biological overtones, uh, it, it came out of a, uh, a crazy question I asked myself some years ago, uh, which I, I, I wouldn't have dared to write a an, an application uh, for grant funding for. But but I'm retired and I can pursue what I like to do, uh, and I, I think there may be something uh, to it uh, in any case. Uh, you can uh, judge for yourselves if I can get my machine to going again. Uh, yeah, there it is. All right. Uh, yes, uh, programming and biomolecular computation. We published a, a few papers uh, uh, about it. And uh, I can tell you a little more of the history uh, uh, a, bit, a bit later. But um, uh, Alan Turing started, of course, the theory of computation going, and he's very very well known at the, at the moment. Uh, he did a convincing analysis of the, th of the nature of computation. What is computation? Looked at informally. And he came up with a very early formal model. He wrote the very first programmer's manual, uh, and this was in the 40s, I think. Uh, proved undecidability of the halting problem. Uh, his, he didn't call it the universal Turing machine, but it was a universal machine. It was a self-interpreter in computer science jargon. And he contributed a lot to the, this confluence of ideas, the ideas that all sensible models of computation are equivalent to each other. And this, this has held for a long time until people started talking about quantum computing and, and other uh, maybe realistic, maybe not realistic uh, ideas. But uh, certainly was the case for many, many, many years, that this list uh, of very different looking computation mechanisms were actually equivalent. The problem can be solved by, uh, uh, say, recognition of the numbers can be solved by a Turing machine, if and only if it can be solved by a lambda expression, if and only if you can do a Kleene recursive function, and, and so on. Uh, there have been many models showing it equivalent. About these models, why are there so many? How do you compare, uh, compare two of them? How could you uh, improve them? W one way to answer that is asking what are the models good for? Are they good for writing programs or for uh, doing modeling or proving theorems? And uh, of course, just to make the picture even more complicated, uh, there's this new direction of biological computing, which at least looks like it has an enormous potential, in spite of the mis right parenthesis. Uh, the, uh, there are many concepts that are still unclear, and there's this question of modeling versus programming, uh, and, and we'll get into those in a bit. Uh, now, one definition of a reasonable model of computation uh, was a model in which p-time computable problems are the same as problems that are p-time computable on a Turing machine. Um, the name de Boas came, up, came with that. Ugo de Lago proved that was true, say, for the lambda calculus. Yeah. And there have been other. Uh, a 
computing models should be good for general program solving, general problem solving. Uh, it should be programmable, possible to write programs. It should be Turing complete. It should be a, 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 a self-interpreter. And this blob is model of computing is uh, what I'm talking about today. And it was originally motivated by biological computing, which looks like it could do a lot with respect to, uh, for example, just pr reproducing biologically enormous numbers of computing devices. Uh, it gives also a different set of dimensions of requirements on, on the model of computing. And why do I call it blob? Because I was thinking originally, some days I was thinking about molecules, other days I was thinking about cells, and I realized that what I was doing was, was neither, though it was similar. So I ended up just saying, well, it's a blob, uh, and no particular meaning to it. But I've discovered some other people have done blobs. What got this started was I visited a top-notch uh, computer science research institute, and I found I couldn't understand, I could understand almost nothing of what they were talking about. Uh, it was Carolyn Talcott, uh, uh, who has a very uh, active group at Stanford Research Institute. Uh, they're using a term writing system called MOD uh, to model biological systems. Uh, as a computer scientist, I thought, gee, this is exciting. Where are the programs? Well, in a certain sense, the modeling language, MOD, is a language of programs. So, but what was being modeled, I, I couldn't see any programs there. Uh, there were complicated biological processes where, where activity was happened by a chain of signaling. One cell is adjacent to something else, which is adjacent to something else, and essentially bits are moved across one step at a time. But that's very different from what we know in, in computer science. Uh, I, I, I couldn't see a program that realized or directed a computational process. And uh, I finally realized that there were a lot of problems that uh, were being cleverly solved by Mother Nature or by biologists, but uh, it was very hard to see what problem they were solving. Where is the algorithm? And we're used to thinking of control in computer science. So finally, I decided to resolve that problem by inventing one of my own. And that's what this is about. Uh, there are existing connections between biology and computation, especially Luca Cardelli and several others have proven that in some sense any computable function can be computed by a biological um, uh, structure with different definitions of biological structure. The arguments were not very compelling from a programming viewpoint. They involved very quickly going to Goodall numbers, to simulating two counter machines, doing things that would take not only exponentially slower, but multiple exponentially slower uh, than natural algorithms. And so uh, that's where the aim came from. It's a computation model where the program is clearly visible and natural, and the Turing completeness is, is a, a natural uh, thing that comes out of this. You could argue that any biological structure is finite, and therefore they can't be Turing complete. Uh, but I'm uh, imagining computation happening in some kind of biological soup, which is a technical word that they actually use, uh, uh, which is expandable uh, uh, by need. Uh, the second problem is this term model, which has always bothered me, that there's two very different meanings of modeling. In the natural sciences, they're analytic. There is an already existing reality, and a model should be something that um, explains uh, what happens in reality. And if it's a good model, then you can make predictions about what will happen. Uh, in computer science and engineering, model checking is something completely different. Uh, here, we begin with a specification, and a, uh, a good model is something that satisfies the program, specialization, uh, the program specification. Uh, the uh, modeling is uh, essentially a, a synthetic process. And so there's, there's two different meanings there, and I finally realized it was important to distinguish them. 
uh, a small insight uh, in this was that this confluence of ideas that computing devices are equivalent had analytical overtones. That there were many different models that were invented independently, and then they were studied and discovered to, to be equivalent to each other. So in that sense, uh, the emergence of computability theory was a kind of an analytic overtones. But Turing's work, he was designing machines, he was doing programming, that was all synthetic. It was building things up from the bottom. And uh, ju just a, a matter of, I'm sort of skating on the boundary between the synthetic and the analytic here. Uh, natural science, computer science, this project was to design a biology-like computing model with programs. And uh, I hope it doesn't fall into the category I've heard of a very nasty paper review once that said, this paper fills a much needed gap. But uh, I, I, I hope this no, no, may fill a needed gap. Uh, wanted to establish a biologically feasible framework, whatever that means, uh, where programs are visible and where programs are first-class citizens, where they actually can exist. Biology is not hardware. Uh, if we want to think about biological computing, we have to re-examine our assumptions that are natural for programming languages. Computers have lots of things that are good for the programmer. They have a large address space, randomly accessible data. They have pointers to data. If you say, what is in cell 1396, then you can find in uh, one microsecond or whatever your time clock is, um, you can find the cell, uh, the contents of cell 1396. They have address arithmetic. They have index registers. They have many different devices to enable um, access to, to data at a distance. They have unbounded fan-in. A, a, a single word in memory can have an arbitrary number of pointers to it. Not one of these is biologically feasible. The biological computation, things have, uh, uh, in the biological world, things happen with physical contact. They, they, you don't have uh, pointers, you don't have uh, action at a distance. And we need some kind of workaround for these if we want even to talk about a biological computing. There should be no action at a distance, no pointers to data, no non-local control transfer, whatever that means. However, there is a, is a yes a that there are available resources to tap. There's energy to change a program control point to add bonds uh, data, but, uh, bonds between data. And the biological analogs are HEP, which apparently is a method for trans transporting energy from one part of a cell to another. Uh, oxygen is where a lot of it comes from, uh, thank goodness for our atmosphere. And even Brownian movement uh, at some low level uh, can, can, can be exploited. Now, this blob model is just assuming that this stuff exists, that um, there is this, it's a simplified model of a molecule, and the computation step is a model uh, I was inspired by the equations I remember from high school chemistry uh, course, courses, where one group of molecules can interact and produce another group of molecules. Uh, a blob is in a biological soup. There, each blob has four bond sites, and these bond bonds can uh, connect this blob to other blobs. In this case, there are th three of them that are connected to something, and one one that's uh, free, unoccupied. Uh, a, a technical thing, which is only for convenience, and you'll see where it comes up uh, in a bit, was that assumed a blob has eight bits, eight bits of information, call a cargo bit. But uh, and this is, isn't completely unrealistic. That uh, I learned from the Stanford Research Institute people that the molecules uh, can have uh, connections that are phosphorylated or not phosphorylated. 
And this is part of the concept of, of signal uh, uh, transmission from one place in a cell to another is when, when a given uh, uh, molecular bond is changed from phosphorylated to non-phosphorylated. And this amounts to a bit in the sense that, uh, that we're used to, used to here. I, I know I'm stretching in analogies, but uh, uh, to keep in, keep the focus, how can we structure a biologically feasible model? Well, the idea is to keep the current program cursor and the current data cursor always physically adjacent to each other. So a program is a collection of blobs. The data is a collection of blobs of exactly the same nature. And the, uh, the bug is a bond between the currently active program point and the currently um, uh, accessed data point. Uh, now, continue a little bit further. What can happen uh, at, uh, at that bond? Well, at, in the program side, you have an instruction. The instruction can, can specify that the data cursor should be moved to a neighbor. Uh, it could uh, test whether the data, the blob at, the other, at this end, uh, has a bond number three, for example. Uh, it can test whether one of these cargo bits is a one or a zero. There's also an equivalent of cons in a functional language to insert an, a new bond. And here, we're assuming everything is happening within a nutritious soup, so you can imagine accessing using some of that material to uh, produce a new, a new bond. Of course, it has to be connected to the ones that you were scanning. Uh, and a little bit of local geometry. And finally, the last point is that we allow limited fan in. Uh, a blob can have, uh, has four bonds, so you, you could have two um, uh, bonds pointing to the same blob in the program. And you need that for a go-to, for a loop, for example. If you want a loop in your program, uh, you'll, you'll need that kind of structure. Uh, here's an example of an instruction. The current pr program cursor, uh, there's an instruction which says set cargo bit 5 to 1. Its net effect will be to find cargo bit number 5 on the data, on the scan data blob, and change that uh, to a 1. So you see, the, this is the current point of control, which is indicated by the 1. Uh, after the instruction is executed, the uh, point of control is uh, the successor of this one. And this um, cargo bit number five is changed from something we didn't know. Now it's definitely a one. We set it to one. Uh, the control activation bits have been swapped. And this is uh, a magical bit that indicates where the currently executing instruction is. If bit zero is the activation bit has a one in it, then that's the current instruction. Uh, finally, what's an instruction? Well, an instruction is at eight bits, these cargo bits that I mentioned. I've broken them up into the first bit says, uh, is, it active? is it an active instruction or not? The next three bits identify the opcode, set cargo bit. The Last three bits identify which bit, number five. And finally, this is the value that, that it's set to. So, uh, and I've got a, a, a set of instructions that resemble very much a traditional machine code, the kind that I learned back in 1960. Uh, the, at this point, uh, see if I can't get to the... Uh, just a second here, we, yeah, here we are. Uh, at last, uh, we have, uh, so in this structure here, the data is a uh, collection of blobs that are linked by, according to the different bond sides. The program, uh, for some reason, is inside. Uh, the current instruction is a set cargo bit. And it, and this is the bug, it uh, joins the current instruction to the current, to the uh, visible data, uh, data blob. Uh, the data blob has, has different things on it. 
uh, if I start this program up, uh, then then uh, is th th this is a loop visible in the program. Control is going around the loop. As it goes around, uh, it, it finds an instruction, it executes it, and then goes to the next successor instruction. What the program is doing is it's looking for a, a blob uh, with a certain cargo bit. Uh, uh, it hasn't found it yet, but it continues looking. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, eventually it will find it. And when it finds it, uh, uh, it then goes. Um, will go. To, uh, it goes to the exit instruction. At that point, uh, uh, it, it has stopped. So it found the cargo bit that it was looking for. So you, you can get a feeling for how these things work, uh, uh, even without seeing all of the the ugly details. Uh, yes, here we are. So the aim of the model was a. a a model that is plausible in by semantics by chemical-like reaction rules, preserving that things are always adjacent. The idea is that the, if necessary, the program uh, blobs move around to maintain this invariant that the program cursor is always adjacent uh, to the uh, uh, to the data cursor. Uh, it's programmable a bit like a very low-level machine code. It's uniform. To solve new problems, you don't need new hardware. You don't need, need new, um, uh, new devices. You can write programs for the old one. It's stored program, because programs and data are exactly the same thing. Uh, the only difference is the currently executed program bit has a one. A uh, program has a one in its activation bit. Uh, and um, then they, these were also goals here, that it should be uh, uh, as powerful as other computation devices. There are other devices, and of course that's one of the first questions is, well, how does this differ from cellular automata or whatever? Uh, well, in the first place, many things that people call computation devices uh, and claim they're universal are not uniform. To solve new problems, you need new circuits uh, or uh, new BDDs or new finite automata. So you have to change the hardware to change the problem that's being solved. So that's, that's not satisfactory to me. Uh, the Turing machine is uniform. Uh, and the positive thing is that there is a visible program uh, it's uh, Turing complete and has a universal, uh, which means it has a universal machine. Uh, a negative, though, is that it, the Turing machine is very slow. It is this long one dimensional tape. And um, if you have a self interpreter, you have to keep going back and forth between the current control point in the simulated program and the data that it's working on. And it's continually going back and forth, which gives, at the very least, a quadratic slowdown. There are many other program-based models that the mathematicians have developed, or the computer scientists, like Lisp or Minsky. Or, and they're good for theoretical purposes, but they're not very plausible in any physical sense. Any, there's the cellular automaton, which the Neumann's machine or Life uh, Wolfram has made a, a small industry out of books on cellular automata. And they have, with great difficulty, been shown able to simulate a Turing machine. Uh, the negative side is that they're not biologically plausible. All state transitions happen synchronously. Uh, you can get around that problem, as I understand. But there's no clear concept of a program. What is the program in our cellular automaton? The only, the only parameter you can really adjust is the initial pattern of cells, of, of, what, of the states, of the uh, starting point. And there's certainly no natural universal cellular automaton, because uh, there there's really seems to be no natural way to represent, uh, to represent an arbitrary cellular automaton as uh, the state of a certain sub-pattern. Uh, at least I haven't run across it. Right, yes. In this case, uh, this is the program. Uh, it's a pan of two lists. 
uh, I can't remember which one is the first argument, but, but it's uh, the, the program uh, is attached to a cell which out to a blob, which is then adjacent to the beginnings of the two lists. The program basically has a, 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 first a loop to go to the end of the one list, and once it's got to the end of that list, then to, to join it on back onto the other. So we can see how, how it works. Uh, uh, right. So here, here it's going through the first loop, and it's coming, finding the end of the first list. Once it gets to the end of the first list, uh, if you could see it, uh, it then moves back to the end, back to the end, joins this one cell at a time to the other list until it gets to, uh, to, the, to the end. And at this point, it has put the two together into a single list. And that's just the, the simple instructions of the kinds that we talked about before. Instructions, well, there are opcode, there's some parameters, and, uh, and well, an instruction is uh, in a blob, so by its nature it has four, four bond sides as exits. So there's really the eight bits uh, include the opcode and the parameters. And uh, about this point you can ask, why are there four bonds? Uh, well, the current, remember, program instructions, they are also in blobs. So every instruction, uh, how, what are the demands on our instruction? Well, there has to be a true and false successor, because there have to be tests. You have to be able to choose one way or the other. This takes up two bonds. Uh, you will need a predecessor. Uh, there's... Uh, well, um, mainly in order, to, in order to write the programs. Uh, th this gives uh, three bonds. And finally, there needs to be a bond to link the program cursor to the data cursor. So uh, that, may, that makes uh, four at all. And it's almost like a von Neumann machine code. But a bond is a two-way link between two adjacent blobs. It's uh, not a one-way pointer. Uh, a bond is definitely not an address. There's no address space. There's no address decoding uh, uh, hardware. Uh, there's not any, a formal version of register, that, but of course you can use the cargo bits. You can set them to one and zero, so you can get the effective registers. But, but this is the radical part, is that there are no addresses. Uh, they are just adjacent blobs. And um, this, this is the usual ugly details, which I'm not going to bother to explain, except uh, the parameters. There are, there, are, there are bond site numbers that say, for example, set cargo bit uh, uh, on, and this says which, which, uh, bond, which uh, cargo bit it is. There are uh, other things that say which bonds, whether it's bond number three or bond number one, you want to insert. And then there's a one-bit value. And at this point, it's just the usual sort of tedious um, engineering type work to, to define it. And that you're going to pack it all into eight bits. And of course, I spent a lot of time at the blackboard figuring out how to do things in eight bits. Uh, now, at this, at this stage, uh, I'd like to shift gears and think about the more of the computability aspects. And in particular, in what sense is this model universal? Well, the, the usual version, Turing completeness, the purpose is to show that any Turing computable problem can be simulated by um, the, the blob mechanism. So the usual approach, if you want to show that an interesting uh, language M is Turing complete, you show that for any Turing machine program, that you can construct a blob program which computes the same thing. You have to be a little careful about data encodings and stuff like that, but it's basically at the bottom is saying that what the uh, uh, program Q would have computed is faithfully simulated by program P. And it's almost always step at a time simulation. So there's a, a straightforward process. Here L and M are languages and uh, the way to show that blobs are uh, 
Turing complete. Uh, Luca Cardelli did, did this, for example, in a, in a version uh, where L is a, you begin with a Turing complete problem, like two counter machines. Uh, you show it can be simulated by a biomolecular system of the sort that we're studying. And the technical trick is to show how, given any two counter machine program, to build a biomolecular system that simulates it. And, and this, I'm not claiming it's fast. Two counter machines are slow to begin with. And, but in principle, this can be done. Turing did a different approach back in 1936. He wrote an interpreter. His universal machine is not a, <clears throat> the result of a translation from one problem to another. Rather, it's something which is given both a program to simulate and its data. Uh, um, then it proceeds to, uh, to simulate the input program on the data. Uh, the effect is, that in a sense, it's hand computing this quantifier that, uh, try, uh, that uh, uh, is the universal machine essentially isn't producing a program cube, but rather it's, I, I could, should have written a different equation, but it's something like the meaning P applied to a piece of data is the same as Q applied to program P and the data. And this was uh, an interpreter, uh, the, in the sense that we know interpreters from computer science. The universal machine can execute any Turing machine program uh, if you code uh, the simulated program on this tape. And uh, our research is following this line. It's doing simulation by general interpretation, and not by one uh, at a time program translation. Uh, the uh, universal uh, uh, an interpreter is given a program and its data, and it should achieve the same effect as running the program would have on that data. Uh, the, we programmed a uh, self-interpreter uh, for the blob machinery, believe it or not. Uh, uh, the, this was uh, done by a couple of hard-working graduate students, and this work, by the way, I should say, was joint uh, with, with them, Lars Hartmann, uh, Soren Brest, and uh, uh, with Jakob Kuhl-Siemensen, who's also at DQ. Essentially, this gives a self-interpret, this gives a universal machine in the biological framework. How does self-interpretation work? Well, the interpreter is as its program, uh, the program P as a piece of data, and the data for program P. The interpreter may also have some administrative uh, data to keep track of, uh, of useful information. Uh, the, that's, that's essentially a schematic describing how, how it works. Here is a picture of the self-interpreter. It is a collection of blobs, uh, a couple of thousand, I think. This is the beginning one. Uh, how does it work? Well, you remember an instruction had eight bits. So uh, what this is, is a decoder. It's testing the first bit, and if it's a zero, go one way, and if it's a one, go another way. The next one is something testing the second bit. Eventually, after you get down to 256 possibilities, which are here about 80% of the way to the edge, the next instructions are the instructions to simulate that instruction. Once you know what uh, the instruction was, then um, uh, the interpreter will simulate it in its own data. And once the instruction has been simulated, then control comes back uh, to the center. How does it come back to the center? Well, no, it's not a go-to. Uh, you need a binary tree uh, to, to be able to achieve the action uh, to avoid having action at a distance. So this isn't a pointer, but rather uh, it's the beginning of a, of a tree that eventually ends coming back uh, to the beginning. Well, this has actually been programmed and run uh, on not very large examples, but, but it works. Uh, and the uh, one, one point is that 
the blob programs don't have to be encoded. They just are these set of eight bits. Okay. Uh, a, uh, so you don't have the painful things you have with, say, Turing machine, universal machines. The self-interpreter doesn't have an asymptotic slowdown, as does the Turing machine. And geometrically, the problem is the blob model has a higher connectivity. There are more links between things than in the Turing machine, so you don't have the one-dimensional tape. Uh, and the other point is that the time to interpret one blob instruction is bounded by a constant. And what's the constant? Well, it's, it's the, width, the, the width of this uh, 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 graph structure here. Uh, okay, that's uh, right, yeah. So now we can get back to this question of what do we want in a model of computation? And we wanted, in the first place, we wanted to have programs, or at least that's what frustrated me so much in Stanford Research Institute. I couldn't see the programs. Now we do have them. Uh, we wanted uh, during completeness, we have that. Uniformity, strong finiteness. This is a little trickier to say, but the, basically the point is that one set of hardware can be used to solve all problems. And in some sense, this is not even true for Turing machines, because different Turing machines have different numbers of states, different numbers of control points. But um, a, an arbitrary finite number of states can be merged into this framework by using a binary tree, a decision tree. And uh, the, that's the trick we've done in uh, an appendix to our first paper. Uh, Jakob Gruel worked this out in, in careful uh, uh, for the Turing machine, showing the blob could simulate that. Uh, the model uh, would be, it would be nice if it's physically realizable, execution without action at a distance. Uh, we should have programs allowable as data objects, and they should be both readable and writable. Well, this works because a program is just a, a set of blobs. The only thing that can happen is that there can be an activation bit that's on or off that decides whether the current instruction is executing. And plausible running times. And uh, the, uh, at this point, uh, while well, the blob model is a bit baroque, um, it, its overhead is, const is constant. So uh, it's not going to be drastically different than the other program it's simulating. And I think uh, I'm getting near, near the end of this set of slides. This uniformity is saying that one set of hardware is enough for all the different problems. And the von Neumann architecture is not an example of this, because your computer may have 64 bits in a word, but it's not extendable. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it may be very large, but it's, but it's finite. And here we're making the assumption, well, you could assume that you can have arbitrary number of tape units available and then put in more tape when necessary. Uh, applied to programs, strong finiteness, uh, there's only a fixed set, an a priori fixed number of instructions independent of the program you're solving. And uh, you could think that that sounds unlikely, but as I, as I said before, we, we have shown we can simulate an arbitrary Turing machine using fan in to implement the, the state transition. And the, the fan in is not unbounded, but it's at most two, because the, the blobs are, uh, there's only four types of blobs. What seems just around the corner is, uh, well, um, maybe the first one isn't just around the corner, but we do need a better language for programming. It's rather painful to write these 8-bit instructions. It would be nice to have an intermediate level programming language, and that's a language design problem. Uh, the, it would be nice to have some sort of type system to be able to recognize obvious, obviously wrong programs. Uh, the, it would be nice to have program activation. And in principle, that seems to be, there seems to be no problem with the model. 
And once you have, you can generate a program in the form of a collection of blobs, and then just set the activation bit of the first instruction, and suddenly it will start going. This, this leads to the idea of a parallel uh, computation. Uh, uh, we haven't really seriously investigated it, but it, it, it makes sense. And the fact that each blob has exactly four bond sites mean that you avoid the contention problems that you often get in parallel models, where you, where you have different processes trying to access the same resource at the same time. Here, you have to say access by bond site number two or bond site number three. You have to say which one it is. Uh, the uh, one thing that I've sort of sidestepped is how much time does it take, for example, to move the current program around so the, the current and the active instruction is adjacent to the current data. And, um, uh, and we should have a cost model that includes this, this code motion that is needed. And uh, then, of course, one can dream um, that uh, one might, if you can generate programs dynamically, isn't this something a little bit like reproduction, biological in computation? And I think that was really what, what got, got me started with this line of thought, was kind of imagining you know, could you simulate self-reproduction yeah, in, a, in a more literal sense uh, than computer scientists normally take it. Uh, there are certainly things that have not been, that been done. And getting a tighter analogy between self-reproduction and universal Turing machine, uh, universal blob program, um, usable higher order language, a, something that would be not just plausible but actually uh, closer to being visually realizable. And it's a bit scary, the idea of putting together a collection of test tubes and liquids that would, would do what I've talked about. But at least it doesn't seem physically as improbable as executing a, a, a Neumann computer uh, you know, in the biological context. And, uh, and finally, uh, the last thing that uh, I have a somewhat checkered history, partly in complexity theory, and it occurred to me very quickly that the connectivity of these blobs is basically is un unlimited. But if you want really to execute them, you would have to pack them into a three-dimensional space. This would make some of the bonds very long. So you would have to introduce intermediate blobs uh, to, to keep the adjacency. And this would add to computational time. So uh, it uh, would my, my guess is that a, a complexity class would be different in an unbounded dimension space, as I've been talking about, uh, as compared to, say, a, a three-dimensional space. Uh, there have been a bunch of people that have worked on this. Uh, uh, Cardelli, uh, um, well, there's a lot of people. There was a paper called Toward Molecular Programming with DNA. Um, there have been many things that are going. And, and this can be described as another Toward uh, um, uh, paper, but with maybe a little different set of basic assumptions uh, than the others. Okay, and, and, and that's the end. Uh, the question was about uh, data. Uh, it was saying that in many, in uh, other models of molecular computation that, you, that you've seen, they didn't have an explicit uh, version of data, and they were somehow just assuming that Brownian motion um, uh, would realize uh, could be used. And uh, yeah, and my my answer was that uh, yes, uh, uh, to me the data uh, and programs are. Both uh, both exist, and they can be the blob can be used either as program or as data, but they're the same kind of object. Uh, so for for me, the uh, the distinction was important. But the question is, where do the resources come from? Uh, and here I've made this fuzzy talk about a biological soup where uh, you could get what you needed. And you said you had two questions. Yeah, the second one is more philosophical one. Yeah. Why would we assume that? biological system compute an algorithm? 
<laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And uh, I found the biological people that I've talked to uh, just looked confused when I started talking about unbounded problems in Turing, because they're, they're used to thinking of everything as being finite. Uh, and, uh, yeah. I, th I think here it came mainly because of my computability background. Is to, to me, the class of all computable partial recursive functions is a very real thing, and I wanted to see if it could, if it could perform on this stage. Uh, and I think I didn't repeat your question, but uh, the question had, had to do with concurrency. Uh, and uh, the, the first, my first reaction, I, I see nothing in principle against having many different activation uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, then the next question was about uh, one could imagine forking processes where one blob activates two neighbors. Uh, and, um, and that makes perfect sense. And the last question was, could one imagine joining again? Uh, and I, I, I've thought about it. I, I can't find a sensible semantics for that. Okay, okay. the question is about the, uh, the behavior of a blob program that was packed into a three-dimensional space. And uh, these uh, in-direction uh, 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 blobs that are inserted, uh, um, how could they be recognized during a computation? And how do you know when to insert them? Yes. So there are enough of them. Right, exactly. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the answer I, I would give to that is that it's very much like uh, in complexity theory that when you, you define p time, p time is a set of problems such uh, which are decidable by programs that run in polynomial time. Uh, the complexity doesn't address the question of analyzing the program to make sure that it does run in polynomial time. Uh, it's just a, in some sense, it's a definitional artifice. It's saying, if problem X can, can be decided by some program that runs in polynomial time, uh, then X is in, is in P time. And I think that, uh, that would be basically my answer uh, uh, here, that I would be considering only blob programs that uh, can be simulated in three-dimensional space and as an a priori assumption, rather, and not something that is decided by program analysis or, or by runtime tests of the program, uh, in the same sense that you don't have this in, in complexity with the definition of, of p time. Yeah, that may not satisfy you. If I think you're asking for something more. Is, so is that set of programs too incomplete? Which oh, uh, universal program. Oh, uh, they split in three D. Uh, well, the the one that we constructed. Uh, um, that, that big fuzzy diagram that I showed you uh, was constructed by, uh, uh, from the universal program by craft drawing uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. The but main, the main question data, would... It could be an arbitrary graph. Right. The, the main problem with that was that the, the links from the edge of the diagram back to the center uh, are... Uh, I, my intuition is telling me that it's only a polynomial slowdown, but I'm uh, uh, standing here and now I, I can't give you a, a solid argument for it. But, I, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, a, it's, a, it's a, at worst a polynomial slowdown. But it could be like is it the same way that a Turing machine, uh, you can get a quadratic slowdown between the running time of the program being simulated and, and the running time of the universal machine. Uh, that, that, that's my intuition, but I, I don't have a, a solid argument for that. And my intuition here is kind of like the, the question that, that John raised about whether uh, the 3D programs would be Turing complete or not um, might raise some issues similar to graph drawing, whether you could draw something on a 2D graph or a 3D graph kind of planar graphs. Um, there's a, questions of reachability somehow that, that may come up when you put a dimension restriction. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, 
Yeah. At, at the worst, you can embed a, a Turing machine tape in the blob world and simulate a universal Turing machine. So I think anything computable is computable, but, but that would be a high price in complexity. Now, uh, the question was, was how, how did we implement uh, uh, this, this self-interpreter? Uh, the answer is, of, of course, no, we did not write a, a long list of 8-bit instructions. Uh, but uh, um, Lars Hartmann uh, developed a, a, a system of macros um, um, that could be used to realize uh, higher order actions and their net effect was was achieved by uh, uh, unfolding, so that they, the net result was it was just very long. And that's one reason the self interpreter was so large, uh, uh, but, but at least it was understandable. I have a quick question. I was really uh, intrigued by the three D animations or the two D animations because they do evoke this kind of uh, image of uh, like uh, protein folding or some chemical. Uh, process and I was wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, what's involved in, in creating these visualizations because they do kind of help ground this uh, biological feel and, and, and they do kind of as soon as I saw one of them it helped me ground this idea of, of biological computing. Okay, um, um, yeah. let's see, so uh, basically the, the way that the um, graphs were produced uh, was using a physical simulator uh, where the uh, blobs were essentially equivalent to, to nodes connected by springs. Um, uh, I think as I it may have been a differential equation simulator. I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, it was uh, that model, and you, you can you you can see what happens uh, as this runs as uh, when blobs would appear to get too far apart, uh, then, then the others move closer, but they do it uh, in a very local way. So, so, so all the action is happening close to, uh, to, to the bug, and that, that was, we, we weren't sure in advance how that was going to work out, <laughs> but, but it, seems, it seems rather clear that, that it is local. And also it has this, this effect of sitting here sort of Continually vibrating and moving around a bit that feels like Brownian motion, and that that was just a, a free. It was by chance. <laughs> it's much easier to see the, the the biological connection than if we were looking at reductions, a sequence of reductions of rewrite rules or something like. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I think very visually, and I think it. Then we began thinking about um, some pictures like this, and then seeing whether whether I could come up with some formal definitions that would behave the way, the way I, was, I was thinking. Whether I was half asleep or having nightmares, I don't know. But <laughs> no. oh, now many programs exist in this blob world. Uh, uh, bah, bah, bah. Somewhere between 20 and 40. Uh, you know, we've, we've implemented uh, several standard functional programs, like the, uh, the append example. And, uh, and the self-interpreter, of course, you has lots of bits and pieces, uh, but uh, there's been no serious programming in it beside the self-interpreter. But the self-interpreter definitely looks like a fairly big. Yeah, program. that that was a pretty big program, and uh, it was a proof of concept. Right. Um, I would like to present uh, a small gift to Neil as a token of our appreciation for your coming to visit us. So. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you.